everyone, I'm Ifani. I'll be talking about truncated variant produced value iteration. This is based on joint work with Yu Jia Jin and Sitberg, who's in the audience, and Jia Yu Wen. So um, before getting into the technical details, I'll just provide a bit of high level mode. Oh, sorry. Oh, it's a volume knob. Thank you. Hello? Hello? Sorry. Did I start over? Uh, yeah, so I'll be talking about truncated variant produced value iteration. In case you didn't hear it, this is based on joint work with Yu Jia Jin, Aaron Sidberg, who's in the audience, and Jia Yuan. Um, so, so before we're getting into the technical details, I'll give a bit of high level motivation for, the, uh, for our work. So throughout this talk, I'll be considering the problem of solving a gamma discounted infinite horizon MDT to some additive accuracy epsilon. Um, and for now, we'll assume that we're in the generative model setting. So I'll define what this means formally a little bit later, but for now, let's just assume that we're able to draw transition realizations for any state action pair. So essentially, if we're in some state S, we can sample, say, k next state transitions associated with taking the action A in that state. And so this is kind of a theoretical um, RL uh, framework but you can imagine it might have some real world applications. For example, it could model um, offline RL settings where you can simulate transitions. Now the idea is that simulating these transitions could be expensive, and so we want to be able to compute epsilon optimal policies without um, making too many queries to this generative model. And of course, we'd also like to use low space and runtime if possible. So one of the motivating questions for our work is that um, we notice there's a sample complexity gap between model-based and model-free methods. So throughout this talk, model three basically means algorithms which use space on the order of number of state action pairs, and model based will mean algorithms which use more space. And so if we um, fix the discount factor gamma and look at the sample complexity versus epsilon, the error of your approximate policy, then the green curve shows that information theoretic lower bounds for this problem match the model based algorithm for this problem. So model based algorithms resolve the sample complexity of this problem. But if we look at the purple curve, we see that model free methods are not quite able to achieve the optimal sample complexity for the full epsilon regime. So in particular, in this epsilon uh, greater than one large epsilon regime, they're not able to um, match those information theoretic lower bounds. And so we have the sample complexity gap in the large epsilon regime. And you might be wondering, why do we care about this large epsilon regime? Well, essentially, uh, you can imagine that in some cases, your state um, space may be massive or your discount factor may be quite large. And your goal is maybe just to compute a coarse optimal solution. So the goal is to be able to do this um, with relatively few samples and not have to pay that entire burn-in to get the epsilon equals one accuracy. Um, so one of the questions is, can we improve the sample complexity barrier for model-free methods and try to close this gap between model-free and model-based? So this is closely related to a related question on runtime. So now if we look at the same curve, but now runtime on the y-axis, we no longer have um, the optimal algorithms in terms of runtime. So the model-based methods that were present on the previous slide, they obtain the optimal sample complexity, but they, might not, uh, they don't immediately lead to improvements in runtime. And so we still see this um, barrier in the runtime for these methods. And so a very natural question is, can we get faster methods for these coarse approximations to optimal policies in this large epsilon regime? Yeah, and also for now I'm ignoring interior point methods in, in this diagram, but I'll talk a little bit about those, um, which kind of complicate this diagram a little bit in a few seconds. So um, our work kind of makes progress on um, both of these questions, and um, I'll now go into an overview of the rest of the talk. So first I'll give an overview of the problem statement and the full information setting. This is where the transition matrix P is known explicitly. And I'll talk about runtimes and our improvements in this setting. Then I'll talk about the generative model setting. So I'll define what the generative model means fi uh, formally, and I'll talk about previous sample complexity results and where our improvements fit within those. Um, then I'll give a brief overview of our techniques. So I'll talk about recursive variance reduction and truncation, which are the two key ideas which enable our improvements. And then I'll kind of conclude with the discussion. So a summary and um, some interesting open problems that will hopefully be exciting for you. Um, so I'm sure most of you have already seen a discounted MDT before but I'll just redefine it for the purposes of defining what's taken. Um, so we'll have a finite state space S, we'll have actions available in each state, and we'll use A to denote the set of state action pairs. 
I'll use a toad throughout the talk to refer to the number of state action pairs. Um, so we'll have a transition matrix T, and in the full information setting, we'll assume that this transition matrix T is known explicitly. Uh, we'll have instantaneous rewards R, which I'll assume are between zero and one for simplicity, and then a discount factor gamma between zero and one. And so at each time step T, an agent will start in some state ST, pick an action available at that state, collect the reward, and then transition to a next state, which is drawn from the STA throw of the probability transition matrix. Um, so throughout this talk, I'll use the notation P sub A of S to note the SA throw of the transition matrix um, or the entry of a vector of dimension A2. So a policy is going to map states to actions, and the value of a policy pi is going to be the expected infinite horizon discounted reward um, associated, follow associated with following the actions of that policy. Um, so an optimal fixed policy pi star always exists, um, and this optimal fixed policy, um, uh, I'll denote its value B star, it, it's going to satisfy this Bellman optimality condition. And so our goal is going to be to compute an epsilon optimal policy pi, where the difference between the optimal value and the value of policy pi is at most epsilon. Um, and this will be, uh, the interesting regime of epsilon here is between zero and one over one minus gamma, since our rewards are between zero and one. So what is, <laughs> so um, we have run time. <laughs> so um, uh, I'll talk about kind of state of the art full information setting algorithms for this problem. So um, there's two value iteration star algorithms, first is classical value iteration and then variance reduced value iteration. Um, so value iteration runs in this time a to times the size of the state space over one minus gamma. And then variance reduced value iteration will improve upon this by um, kind of separating this one over one minus gamma times s dependence. So we now have a to times s plus a to over one minus gamma t. Um, I should also mention that there are linear programming um, and interior point uh, method based problems for this um, uh, algorithms for this problem. Um, these are a little qualitatively different in that they depend at most polylogarithmically on one over one minus gamma, but they depend super quadratically on the size of the state space. And so it's a little bit hard to compare these algorithms directly. Um, and also there's um, uh, related work on exact algorithms. So for this uh, talk, I'll focus mostly on high precision algorithms, which have polylogarithmic dependence on epsilon, but there's also exact algorithms that are discussed in the paper if you're interested. Um, so how can we kind of interpret these algorithms which have this qualitatively different dependence on the parameters? Um, so this uh, last linear programming method, for example, is nearly linear when the size of the state space is like a to to the two thirds. Um, and variance reduced value iteration is nearly linear when one over one minus gamma is like s to the one third. And so this kind of gives a sense of how we can compare these algorithms. So our main improvement in the full information setting is we present truncated variance reduced value iteration. Um, and this algorithm um, is similar to variance reduced value iteration in its runtime, except the additive uh, runtime factor is now a toad over one minus gamma squared. So it improves in the additive term. Um, and if we think about where this algorithm is nearly linear, it's nearly linear whenever one over one minus gamma is like lambda. And so this kind of expands the set of um, uh, DMDTs that we can solve in nearly linear time. And it's an open question to further um, improve these bounds or provide uh, conditional lower bounds um, on the runtime. Okay, so now we'll talk about the generative model setting. So recall our problem in the full information setting. We assume that the state space, the action space, the transition matrix rewards, discount factor were all known. Um, the generative model setting is going to relax this assumption slightly. So our goal is still going to be to compute an epsilon optimal policy pi. Um, but we're now going to interact with the transition matrix via this generative model. So the state actions and rewards are still known. Um, but for any state action pair S, SA, we're just going to be able to query possibly many transitions uh, from the probability distribution associated with that state action pair. Um, and so now we can talk about the sample complexity of the problem. And so the goal is now to obtain algorithms which make few queries to the generative model, um, which and also ideally would run in low space and time. So there's been a long line of work on this problem. So first of all, there's this lower bound of a toad over one minus gamma cubed epsilon squared due to prior work. Um, and over the past like two-ish decades, there's been a lot of work on um, getting uh, algorithms for this problem. And so finally culminating in this work on perturbed empirical MDT and planning, which obtains the optimal uh, query complexity for the full epsilon regime between zero and one over one minus gamma. But there were also several works prior which obtained optimal com uh, uh, query complexities in different regimes. And just to kind of compare and contrast these methods a bit and talk about their runtimes and space complexities, I'll focus on these three um, recent algorithms, sublinear variance reduced Q-value iteration, empirical MDT and planning, 
the Church of Empirical MDT and Planning. Um, so first you have sublinear variance deduce uh, Q-value iteration, and this um, has a query complexity which matches the optimal query complexity plus an additive a tote over one minus gamma cubed term. And so this additive term is the reason why uh, the query complexity is only optimal in this epsilon between zero and one regime. Um, empirical MDT methods um, are now are able to improve the optimal query complexity to hold for the entire um, epsilon from zero to one over one minus gamma regime. First there's empirical MDT in planning, which has only an additive one over one minus gamma squared term. And so it's optimal for epsilon between zero and one over root one minus gamma. And then perturbed empirical MD in planning um, resolves with this large epsilon regime and obtains the optimal sample complexity everywhere. Um, but if we take a closer look at these empirical MDT methods, these are what we call model-based methods. And model-based uh, methods typically work by taking the original transition matrix P, drawing some number of samples to build some empirical model P hat of the MDT. Um, and then they can now use some sort of full information algorithm to obtain an approximately optimal policy pi hat for the empirical um, MDT P hat. And so the statistical guarantee here is that when M is sufficiently large, pi hat is also guaranteed to be epsilon optimal for the original MDT P. Um, so for an example of the type of full information algorithm you might run here, you can consider a variance reduced value iteration, which was one of the full information algorithms I discussed a few slides ago. And this algorithm will run in basically the sparsity of P hat plus this additive A tote over one minus gamma cubed runtime. And so you can see that even though these model-based methods are um, improving the query complexity for the large epsilon regime, um, it still kind of hit, uh, these model-based methods still hit this uh, one over one minus gamma cubed runtime factor. Um, and so the improved sample complexity doesn't directly lead to an improved runtime complexity. And so we have this A toad over one minus gamma cubed um, runtime barrier. And so going back to the motivating questions I discussed earlier, um, the first one is just what is the optimal runtime for this problem? Um, and second, if we think about model-free versus model-based methods, um, can we try to get past the sample complexity barrier for model-free methods? It's kind of um, uh, just an interesting question of whether model-based methods are fundamentally more powerful than model-free methods. Right, so um, in the generative model setting, we introduce sampling truncated variance reduced value iteration. And so this is a query complexity that matches that of empirical MDT and planning. So it still has an additive a tilde over one minus gamma squared uh, query complexity factor. Um, so this makes it optimal again between zero and one over root one minus gamma. It doesn't have any additional runtime and it's model free. And so uh, how can we interpret this? Uh, first, it takes a step towards closing the query complexity gap between model free and model based methods in that we're getting um, a model free algorithm which gets optimal query complexity for epsilon greater than one as long as epsilon is less than one over root one minus gamma. Uh, and we also make a step towards optimal runtimes because we're able to break this uh, one over one minus gamma cube barrier. And this um, is the sample complexity and runtime of our method is now optimal in this regime. Okay. Um, so now I'll give a brief overview of the techniques. So I'll uh, talk about two main ideas, uh, which is recursive variance reduction and truncation, which enables our improvement. Um, so I'll, start, um, I'll spend most of my time talking about the full information setting. So I'll talk about value iteration and variance reduced value iteration, which are the kind of key ideas that our method builds upon. And then I'll talk about the two key um, ideas which enable our improvement. And I'll talk briefly about the generative model setting, but I won't spend too much time on it because our results in that setting essentially follow from our full information improvement um, and from the uh, prior work. So I'll also make two simplifying assumptions the rest of the talk. I'm only going to focus on obtaining optimal values and not worry about obtaining approximately optimal policies. Uh, the reason is that uh, based on some techniques from previous work, we can kind of simultaneously try to optimize for values and policies using a technique called monotonicity for those of you who might be familiar with it. And also uh, we can just consider having the error in some initial estimate of the value. So we'll assume that we say start with uh, an initial value of zero and assume a worst case upper bound on the error is like one over one minus gamma. Um, if we iteratively half the error in this initial value estimate, then we're guaranteed that after roughly a tilde one iteration, our final result will be epsilon off. Any questions so far? Right, so I'll start with value iteration. I'm sure many of you have seen this before, um, but essentially uh, we start with the Bellman operator. So the Bellman operator will um, take a value vector and map it to um, a new value vector. It'll take the maximum over all rewards, 
um, plus, uh, so the instantaneous reward, plus um, this expected future utility under value V. So I'll use um, expected utility under value V to refer to these inner products between the transition matrix rows and values in the SVS. Um, and we know because of the Bellman optimality conditions that B star um, is a fixed point of this Bellman object. Um, so the Bellman operator also has, has this contractivity guarantee. So if we take two value vectors and apply the Bellman operator, we're guaranteed that um, the result will be um, a gamma factor closer. Uh, and so value iteration exploits this by starting from some initial value. Um, it iter iteratively applies the Bellman operator. Um, and we're guaranteed that after one over one minus gamma iterations, um, the error in our uh, output value is going to be half of the original. So what is the runtime of this? Um, it's one over one minus gamma times eight toad S. This is because we're doing uh, one over one minus gamma iterations and each t iteration we need to complete this, um, these inner products which takes eight toad times S. So how can we improve upon this? So the key idea behind variance reduced value iteration um, is to use variance reduction to improve this. And so for those of you who are familiar with um, say finite sum optimization. Um, this is very similar to stochastic variance reduced gradient descent or SVRG. Uh, if you're not familiar with SVRG, that's okay, I'll still discuss them in ideas. Right, so again, in the previous algorithm, the bottleneck was computing this expected utility of the current iterate. So we can imagine that instead of computing the expected utility of the current iterate, we could decompose this into two terms. So the first is the expected utility of the um, first iterate, V0. And we compute, can compute this exactly just once up front. And then the idea is that we can estimate um, this uh, difference in the expected utilities between BL and B0 online using queries from a generative model. Now again, we're working in the full information setting, so we require some kind of nearly linear time preprocessing to be able to compute, uh, to prepare a generative model, uh, but we can still use it to and leverage it to get faster algorithms. So um, the idea now is to generate approximate value iteration steps by drawing samples from the transition matrix. So we'll basically replace this expected utility with an empirical expected utility computed over our samples. And we can now um, implement approximate value iteration steps. So we'll just replace the exact expected utilities with these approximate expected utilities. And so previous work showed that the um, accuracy guarantee that you need uh, for maintaining these key vectors is like one minus gamma times alpha approximations. That suffices um, to be able to get uh, the human convergence result. So variance reduced, val reduced value iteration, um, basically use a tumpting's inequality to bound the number of samples that you need in each iteration for each state action pair. Um, and this leads to a total runtime um, of a toad times s plus a toad over one minus gamma cubed. This is because we're doing um, a toad times s work to compute the initial offsets and then a toad over one minus gamma cubed work to be able to compute the samples for state action pair in each iteration, and we're doing this one over one minus gamma iteration. Um, any questions so far? Right, so how can we improve upon this? Um, so if we uh, look back at the previous um, algorithm, the bottleneck is essentially the number of samples that we need to be able to maintain the necessary additive estimates to these key vectors. And so the problem here is that these differences, BL minus B0, could be as large as alpha, our initial error, and the only way that we were able to bound it was using Huffington's inequality. And so this led to this one over one minus gamma squared bottleneck for iteration. So towards trying to kind of get around this, uh, we could instead consider a recursive decomposition and so you can notice that in the L iteration, um, or L plus one iteration, all we really need to estimate is the marginal difference um, in the expected utilities between the last in the last step of value iteration. So if we rewrite um, this expected utility difference between BL and B zero as this telescoping sum, then we can notice that this is just the basically the quantity that we approximated at the first uh, at the previous iteration. Uh, which is the expected utility difference of VL minus one and V zero, plus this like difference between um, the, just the last step, so VL and VL minus one. And so we know that all we need to do is use our fresh samples to estimate this um, smaller quantity. So VL minus V zero will always be larger than like VL minus VL minus one. And so the hope is that by trying to just analyze, uh, just estimate the smaller quantity and analyzing the difference as a martingale sequence, we might be able to get around this one over one minus gamma squared 
um, bottleneck in the number of samples per iteration. Um, and also for those of you again who are familiar with SDRG, this is similar to a variant of SDRG called SARA, uh, which kind of uses the same type of uh, recursion um, to, uh, which applies the same type of recursion to SDRG. Um, in that setting, it doesn't lead to quantitative improvements, but in our setting, we're able to obtain quantitative improvements by combining uh, recursive variance reduction with truncation, which I'll talk about in a few seconds. So is recursion enough? So again, um, the hope is that this DL minus DL minus one term is easier to estimate using fewer samples from the generative model. But the problem is that this term could still be like alpha large. And the reason is that value iteration doesn't really converge kind of smoothly. In a single step, a particular coordinate of their value could grow by roughly alpha amount. And so it's not clear that by doing this recursive decomposition, we rarely achieved anything. Um, we could still have to estimate these large uh, differences. And so we still, worst case, would need um, uh, the one over one minus gamma squared samples. So in order to get around this, this motivates our next idea, which is truncation. And so what if we could try to modify the algorithm itself so that we could guarantee that these differences in a single step um, don't move too much. So if we could guarantee that VL minus DL minus one are closer um, quantitatively than VL minus DC. And so this is the second idea. Um, so again, we're going to consider this recursive uh, decomposition of the expected utilities, and we're going to truncate value iteration steps to try and bound the movement better. So remember, original value iteration does this Bellman operator update, but this could cause large movement in a single iteration. So instead, we're still going to do the Bellman operator update, but we're going to call that V tilde. And now we're going to set DL plus one to be um, the median of three terms. So first is just the value of the Bellman operator update, and then the previous iteration, minus one minus gamma alpha, and the previous iteration plus one minus gamma alpha. So this now ensures that between any um, two steps of value iteration, your values can at most move by one minus gamma alpha in any single coordinate. And so by kind of combining this recursive variance reduction technique and truncation, um, we get our full algorithm. So I'll go through it slowly. Again, recall that the bottleneck in previous work was this number of samples to get one minus gamma alpha estimates uh, for the expected utilities, uh, or difference in expected utilities between VL and V0. And again, we're going to assume that we start with um, uh, initial vector V0, which is alpha optimal. So in each iteration L, um, truncated variance reduced value iteration will first estimate that marginal difference um, in the expected utilities between VL and VL minus one. Um, and it'll use this to update its estimate of Z. So this will now keep a uh, running estimate of the expected uh, difference in utilities between VL and V0. Um, then we'll perform the standard approximate, uh, approximate Bellman operator update. And finally, we'll truncate. So we'll truncate the progress in this particular iteration to make sure our values didn't move too much. And so the analysis proceeds as follows. Um, uh, the key idea is that we're able to show that despite this truncation, the kind of worst case um, convergence rate of value iteration is not harmed. And so despite doing this truncation, we can still get the same sort of one over one minus gamma iteration convergence guarantee. Um, also, we're able to show that now just one over one minus gamma samples per iteration suffices to get these one minus gamma alpha estimates to these G vectors that we wanted to maintain. And so again, the key idea is that value iteration rate is preserved even with truncation. Um, now the differences between successive values is at most one minus gamma alpha in any iteration. And so if we analyze um, uh, this T as like a martingale sequence, then we can use Friedman's inequality to get better um, computation. Uh, bounds on the number of samples that we need. Any questions about this? Um, so now let's talk about the runtime. Uh, so the runtime is very similar as before. Again, we have this first term, which corresponds to computing the initial offsets exactly, and then the second term, which corresponds to um, having this um, one minus gamma, uh, one over one minus gamma iterations um, overall, and then one over one minus gamma samples per state action pair per iteration. So this is essentially um, our algorithm in the full information setting. And now we'll talk about the generative model setting briefly. Um, so if we look at closely at the algorithms on the previous slide, 
pretty much every step of this algorithm already works with the generative model and doesn't actually require the full information access to P, except for one, which is the, cost, uh, the part where we compute these initial offsets exactly. So the solution is simple. We can just um, compute these using the generative model as well. Um, and using similar uh, analysis to previous work by Sitford et al., we can show that one over one minus gamma skewed Gaussian squared sample suffices for a state action pair for just getting these initial offsets to sufficient accuracy. I won't go into the details of this analysis, but I'll kind of give a brief overview of it in a couple slides. Um, but now if we look at the runtime, we have essentially the same runtime as before, but the first term is now replaced by the number of samples that we needed to take to the generative model to compute these initial offsets exactly. Um, and now this runtime, as well as the sample complexity, will be optimal for epsilon between zero and one over root one minus gamma. So just to say a little bit about the analysis of the algorithm, um, uh, if we look at uh, if we look at the number of samples that we need to, uh, to estimate these initial offsets, um, I'll define a little bit more notation. So we'll let sigma of pi star denote the variance of estimating these expected utilities of the optimal value um, under the optimal policy. So just for the actions in the optimal policy. And we'll let P star denote the rows of P restricted to just, again, the rows corresponding to state action pairs that are in the optimal policy. Now, we can show that the error due to estimating these initial offsets is essentially related to I minus gamma P star inverse times the square root of this variance. Um, and we can use worst case bounds from previous work uh, to be able to bound the uh, value of this um, I minus gamma P star inverse times the variance term. And so, um, a nice thing about this is that in the paper, we're also able to uh, provide improved problem dependent guarantees. So if we have better bounds on the sine minus gamma P star inverse variance term, uh, then we can get um, a potentially faster convergence. Okay, so that um, uh, covers most of the techniques. So now I'll, I'll kind of conclude uh, with the discussion. Um, so then uh, I'll start with like a summary of the work. So Again, we considered solving discounted MDPs, and we considered this in the full information setting, uh, as well as the generative model setting. And we presented faster algorithms in um, the full information setting, so we got an HO times state space plus HO over one minus gamma squared algorithm, and this basically breaks the one over one minus gamma cubed um, dependence that was present in previous work. And then we also obtain an algorithm which obtains the optimal runtime and sample complexity in the generative model setting for epsilon between zero and one over root one minus gamma. And so this gives improved sample complexity for model three methods, and then also um, uh, gives improved runtime for the problem um, for model three or model based methods. Okay. Um, so there's um, some interesting future directions for this uh, work. So first, uh, what is the optimal runtime for solving discounted MDPs? So our work makes progress on this, but there's still this one over one minus gamma gap, essentially. Um, so it would be really interesting to obtain, um, say, an H O times S um, plus H O over one minus gamma uh, time algorithm in the full information setting. This might lead to optimal runtimes in the generative model setting as well. Um, and then also in the generative model setting, can we kind of directly obtain um, an optimal runtime algorithm that matches the information theoretic lower bounds or somehow prove some sort of conditional lower bounds against this type of runtime guarantee? Um, another question is, can we close the gap between model-based and model three methods or somehow show a separation between them? So um, is there like, some fundamental power associated with doing this model-based um, approach to reinforcement learning or will model three methods um, obtain similar sample efficiency. Um, and this could be a question that we ask in the generative model setting, but also in other settings as well. Um, and so in particular, can we attain optimal sample complexity for this uh, very large epsilon regime? Um, and then finally, the um, another interesting question is, is truncation necessary? So um, uh, one thing that I kind of glossed over when discussing the algorithm is in each step of value iteration, we truncated the progress between the Lth iteration and the L minus one iteration, or, or the L iteration and the L plus one iteration. And so you can imagine that while this is nice for statistical reasons, it helps us get better sample complexity bounds, it's not that great from a practical perspective because um, ideally, if your algorithm is converging faster, making more progress towards the optimal value in a single iteration, that's a desirable situation and you want to be able to exploit that rather than truncate that away. 
And so um, an interesting question would be, is truncation necessary in order to get these sample complexity improvements? Or is there some sort of practical analog or alternative that will work just as well? Um, and also, would some sort of better analysis um, of existing methods or our method get around the need for truncation? Um, yes, yeah, so theoretically useful, may not be preferable in practice. And then finally, in, it's interesting that we're able to use similar techniques to say SARA and SVRG um, for value iteration here. So we use this recursive variance deduction scheme, which in our setting leads to quantitative improvements, but only after we combine it with this truncation step. So it would be interesting if this sort of idea um, can be used in other settings. Like you don't know that this, um, uh, like to our knowledge, this doesn't lead to improvements for a finite sum minimization, but variance deduction is kind of used broad broadly. So it's interesting to ask whether this has any other applications. Um, so the previous work, um, variance reduced value iteration uses self chain to bound, um, but we use Friedman's inequality. Um, it's like a, a martingale concentration now. Yeah. Of Bernstein. Um, no, it's not. Yeah, that sounds really interesting. I'll definitely take a look at that. I'm not super familiar with those inequalities, but it would definitely be really cool to look into it. Yeah. Yeah, actually that is what we do in the paper. So I didn't talk about monotonicity in, in this talk, but essentially um, the way that we maintain our values is we maintain them monotonically. So all we're really truncating is the, the forward progress. Um, but ideally you would not want to truncate the forward progress either. Or, uh, the forward progress is the good progress. So um, yeah, it's still, it would be interesting to see if we can somehow get rid of that. Yeah, so by truncating to this one minus gamma alpha amount, that's kind of the threshold at which we're able to maintain that the, the convergence rate is not um, harmed for, for value iteration. Yeah, so if you were to try to truncate to like, um, like a smaller amount, then that could re affect the convergence rate of value iteration. And we wouldn't, again, be able to guarantee that gamma contractivity necessarily. Yeah, yeah we haven't worked on the finite horizon setting yet. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so the, yes, so there is um, basically this variance reduced value iteration work. Um, so the uh, model three method, which obtains near optimal sample complexities um, in epsilon from zero to one also extends to the finite horizon setting. Um, but then, and also this model base work, which obtains optimal sample complexities also extends to the finite horizon setting. And there's like this gap there, but um, so yeah, it's interesting to ask whether our work will also extend to the finite horizon setting. Um, 